where the holiday and all of its strange traditions are taken very seriously. It's only 8 o'clock and the streets are already packed with costume visitors. Some to show off, others to blend in, but all to celebrate the magical night of Halloween. The one night a year when we can pretend to be the scariest thing we can think of. Hey everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Two Guys and Some Horror. And this week uh, I chose a very fun film. I think Clark and I really both chose this one because we just loved it so much. And then we also have an awesome guest. John from Blood, Sweat, and Popcorn is here with us this week to talk about it as well. Um, I'm going to do a quick rundown of the film just to give those stats that we always do at the beginning. And then we'll have John kind of talk with us about uh, why he decided to come on the show for this one. So Trick or Treat came out in 2007. Director is Michael DeHerty. Uh, he did things like Krampus, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. He also helped write Superman Returns, X2, uh, some fun stuff. The budget for it was $12 million, um, and it is an anthology uh, based around Halloween, which is awesome. So two things. One, I never, ever, ever want to forget my co-host. So Clark, how are you doing this week, pal? Doing pretty good, man. Uh, this is actually the the first time I've seen this movie, uh, so I liked it, and I want to talk more about it. Yeah, this is one of those films I always introduce people to who are like, what should I watch? Like, what's a good Halloween movie besides John Carpenter's Halloween? I always like to throw this one out there because it is newer, and it definitely is, in my opinion, top notch. So, John, what made you want to come on the show for this uh, film? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, guys. This has been uh, a long time coming, and I'm so glad I could be uh, you know, a part of y'all's show. Um, so Trick or Treat, for me, you know, I, I saw it one time. On, I saw it on a whim, right? I just saw it um, casually. It was recommended by somebody. I forget who. And I watched it, and I, I, it finished. And I immediately turned it back on and watched it again because I knew there was things in this film that I missed. And... That's some of the staying power with this movie. Not only is it a fun film to watch, like as far as like a uh, as a story as it unfolds, but like like you were saying, Curtis, like this this whole um this Halloween atmosphere, Halloween theme behind it is this is like one of the first films I've ever, well one of the few films I've ever seen that really directly puts Halloween the holiday as the front character as the main character on the on the front line because. Yes, there's John Carpenter's Halloween, and that's great for what it is. It's, it definitely has its place in the pantheon of horror films, um, but this one's a little bit different. It's very special because um, it totally, totally embraces the lore of Halloween, which I know we want to get into uh, here shortly. And so because of that, because of it, how it embraces the lore, how it has so many fun interconnecting stories, and how it has such great rewatchability because of those very things, I couldn't help but like say yes immediately. Like I jumped right on it when you said, "Hey, man, you know these are a few films, and that one came up." I, it was you had to say nothing more, further than that. I was already hooked, line and sinker. I was in there. Well said. No, I, I love that, and I, I actually need to rewatch this film. I, I love that you said that, John. Let's uh, let's dig into it, Mister Curtis. What do you think? Are sure. You ready? No. Th yeah. This is. I mean, the first thing I always think of whenever I I want to tell people about this movie is one it's surprisingly short like in real in reality it is not a long movie and it packs a lot into that small space it goes by quick and if you you kind of have to rewatch it like john said because there are things that relate to one another like all the segments are connected to each other in one way or another right and if you watch it the first time you're like oh so that's why that that's why this and I think as we kind of go into it a little bit more, we'll, we'll talk about that. But I kind of want to hear about the things John missed, John missed initially and things that he found as well going on. And I know you've probably found them as well, Curtis. So I'm excited. So, yeah, y'all make great points. Like, it's, it is a very short film. I think it barely crosses 80 minutes, I think, door to door. Um, and, yeah, like, like what Curtis was saying, it's a lot, a lot that happens in the short span of time, of runtime. And that's what's so really also another great uh, punch that this film has is that it packs so much into such a short time frame where, you know, it doesn't have all this fat it should trim off. It kind of just kind of gets to the point, keeps it moving. But again, to Clark's point, every story kind of touches back to another story or forward to a story coming up. And to, to your question, oh, man, like 
you know, a lot of stuff you catch on the first go around because they do a great job of circling back, um, you know, to the very beginning with the couple. Um, the chick doesn't want to do Halloween anymore. She's all she's kind of over it. But then you see the little girl. Uh, oh, what's her? Rhonda with the jack o' lantern that's lit in her wagon. You see that, and um, but some of the things I didn't really catch the first time, like um, when Sam has his the little lollipop that he he bit off into like a makeshift shank. <laughs> you know, you kind of you when you see it again. You see it in the very beginning, in the very opening shot when he kills. Um, oh, what's that girl's name? Emma, or I think I have it written down actually. Yeah, Emma. it is Emma. Yeah. Okay, so Le- when Emma... Leslie Bibbs character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Henry's upstairs, like watching porn, falling asleep. To... I don't know. That's they got a weird dynamic. Those couple, that couple. Natural does. selection. But... <laughs> I, honestly, um, but like a few things I missed too. Like, um, if you know, I picked up on a lot of the dialogue of the the girl group with the werewolves. Like, if I'm um, going back through it a second time and now me like probably my 20th time for all I know I didn't keep track but like um you know she's a runt of the litter or uh, um they they have a lot, a lot of funny jabs that you're like it kind of comes off as like just casual conversational dialogue you don't really have a lot of a lot of doesn't have a lot of meat to it then you go back through it again and when they're hitting on the guy at the checkout store when they're buying their costumes hey we're going to sheep's meadow you know, little things like that, like oh, because they're wolves and they eat sheep. Okay, you know, wolf in sheep's and clothing. It's... Yep. <laughs> right, and, and it's what's so great about those little things is they don't really beat you over the head with them either. They're kind of just subtly placed in there, and it's like a real, it's a real treat, if you will, to kind of pick them back up on the second, third, fourth go around. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. Thanks, Clark. <laughs> I absolutely. I no, mean, I love I, it. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. No, there's there's going to be more. Like you, you hear the howling, like you said, when they go to the uh, the abandoned shaft, and she's like werewolves. Mm-hmm. And it's like yeah. Yep. Okay, yep, so yep, they're yep. going to be werewolves in this movie. When I was watching, and I was like, okay, so werewolves are coming up. <laughs> Did not disappoint. Yeah. No, it's amazing. The I mean, the amount of work that you know Michael Doherty put into this film is is insane. So just a little bit of background that we can break apart. These stories were initially written um, completely separate from each other. So none of them intertwined when he initially wrote this. And in fact, two of them were written back as homework assignments. uh, And then the other two stories he did sometime around 2000. So in his mind, there's four main film or four main stories. Um, And if you think about it, realistically, there are four main storylines going on at any given moment. And then there's kind of one frame. Right. And that's when we did Scare Package uh, from on Shutter. That was kind of one of our very specific uh, points that was brought up as well during watch that watch is like there's always a frame. There's something holding everything together, kind of the skeleton of it. Um, so in this one, if you look at it, you know, Sam is that kind of that um, that yeah, frame, that skeleton. Pin. Yeah. If you lose Sam, I don't think most of these stories hold as much fun. Um, as they do in the future, but we'll break down Sam here in a minute as well. The uh, the other interesting part about the background for these films is that it's all based on an animated short called Seasons Greetings from 1996. Um, really? Yeah, and that actually... I did, I did read that. Yeah, and that, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's the, the main debut of our character Sam, so our little sackhead wearing kid um, who's a demon, just so everyone knows that's he's the, the spirit of Halloween, basically. Um, and there's a ton of lore out there that fans have written that they've pulled from different comic books or different stories that Michael Doherty has been a part of. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the, the entire like influence on this script specifically comes from the midnight hour in 1985. And that, that's kind of fun because if you've never seen the midnight hour, it's a really, it's a really B, I don't know, in my opinion, a B flick from 1985. I've never even heard of this movie. It really feels like it was kind of set to look like a comic book with all of the way, with kind of the graphics they're throwing in with the UX. So it being based off like a 1985 animation really is not surprising to me. Yeah, I noticed that too. Like Frank Miller even gets brought up a lot of times when you talk about this because of that art style. If you've ever seen 300, it's very reminiscent of that comic book art style that Frank Miller was involved with for that film as well. Could we just talk about the credits for a, a quick second though? Yeah. Like back to, to the whole point. So, you know, upon rewatch, again, to like, what do you pick up on your 
on a review on a, a reviewing of it is it kind of telegraphs the whole movie, but in like in a fun way, like a kind of the comic book style credits as they're rolling. We have all these flashes of all these little panels and they have the one with the wolves and they have the one with uh, uh, Mr. Krieg in his house flipping out with Sam and it ha has all these little fun bits that, you know, going in cold the first time you're like, whatever. Okay. Where he's like slamming it. on the window. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you, when you watch it again, like, oh man, he like Doherty was like plotting out this whole film in like a span of like 120 seconds or however long the, the credits were. And as a fun little extra little, little bow on top that I thought was because in the graphics, the comic graphics look amazing. And then, and then it was just a good, a good tie in to the rest of the film. So what I think is nice is it, that open does, you know, the credit open does a lot of that. Yeah setting of the storyline if you if you know what you're watching or you pick up on it or somehow you have like that sixth sense to to see everything coming forward it's very reminiscent of uh when i talked with clark about it makes me think of sleepaway camp when we did that episode mm -hmm. because uh the music in that intro and the quotes you can hear the characters talking and everything they're talking about it's different scenes of the murders throughout that movie if you're paying attention to that intro you can really you basically know what's coming without knowing what's coming, and I think they did a really good job of that with Trick or Treat too in the in the beginning. I had to see Sleepaway Camp again. I haven't seen Sleepaway, Sleepaway Camp since I was probably too young to be watching Sleepaway Camp, to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, Sleepaway <laughs> Camp's the kind of movie where they're just they're trying to throw you off as much as they can. Oh, really? And they do a good job at it. Yeah, well, I, I mean I, they do it on purpose I, I don't, I don't, too. Yeah. The, the killer is like the girl, and you think it's the boy because you see him walk in the room and kill people. There, like I again, like my experience with Sleepaway Camp is is very very small and very much in the past. So, I've got to jot jot that down for a rewatch this month. That's Definitely, right. I just bought two movies off of Scream Factory. We're not sponsored by them. That would be awesome if we could be. Uh, but I actually just bought two collector's <laughs> editions: Trick or Treat uh, and Sleepaway Camp because they were both just on my wish list and. I just happened to grab them. So, um, awesome. unfortunately, Trick or Treat didn't make its collector's edition arrival at my house before we had to watch this. So I watched my Amazon digital version. But uh, you know what? It was still good, even though I didn't get all the fancy stuff. So, so all right. let's kind of yeah. jump into the uh, the first segment here with uh, Emma and Henry. Uh, it's it's a very short segment. It's the introduction that leads into the credits. Uh, and I think that really sets the tone for the film. Uh, you know, she, she just tries to clean up the decorations, you know, before midnight on Halloween because her mom's coming home. And her boyfriend, Henry's like, don't do that. And he goes inside and he's like waiting for his girlfriend to come in. And she just decides to take down the decorations anyways. He comes down and she's a little uh, figure, takes a pumpkin shaped sucker, slits her throat. Her blood stains the sheets. Children run away. The husband or boyfriend comes down and finds her disembodied head, like stuck on, on a stick or a stake, with the pumpkin sucker just kind of jammed in there. Roll credits. I mean, that was pretty. That was pretty rad. That was a pretty awesome way to open up a film. Like, but also it's kind of like it's got kind of like kind of fun to poke fun at the whole like that girl must have been Emma must have been very committed to cleaning up. If she's like, it's not even like the next day, and she's like, no, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't be patient enough to do this tomorrow because well, she, she 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 was also giving Henry a bunch of bunch of crap about you're gonna sleep until noon and you're gonna play video games and stuff and uh, so I get where she's coming from but yeah that was how about that blood that just splattered <laughs> it was like a lot of blood like he got a good good chunk out of her neck or something or whatever he did yeah. got her got her artery perfect uh, oh. in the neck there. No, I think the gore in this movie. One one thing that's really interesting too is like if you're if you're not a big fan of gore or um, you know heavy special effects or stuff like that, this movie does a really good job of kind of hiding away the real gruesome stuff that could happen. There are no on screen kills, so when Emma does get murdered, uh, you don't actually see it happen. You just see kind of the aftermath or the you know the blood splash into the sheet. Um, but I thought that was also, I mean, that's just a really clever way of disguising the, the dead body, too. Um, we did Idle Hands, I think, last week, and the parents being stuck in the jack-o'-lanterns. Like, I don't know why it's so funny, but Halloween, to me, seems like 
the best time of the year for murderers to run rampant because you could blend in and people don't know if they're dead alive i mean think later on when we're on like the you know i know this takes place in ohio but um it's supposed to take place in ohio but the dead body yep. it looks like it's mardi gras right they're having like this huge party or whatever and that girl who gets bit like when they leave the body just laying there in the street it's it's insane how you could just hide a dead body in plain sight right then and you know right then and there so kudos to the scarecrow corpse that's that was pretty neat yeah, they they didn't really uh they didn't really pull they pulled out all the stops really for the per, that Halloween parade. This town throws down for Halloween. If nothing else, that's pretty rad. Like I don't know any other town. Like I've been to Universal Studios like Halloween Horror Nights and they go pretty all out, but that's like the whole point of it. But I've never been to a town where that's like the thing is a hey, Halloween. We're all right. We're shutting everything down. We're having this huge party, and the, but but also then it ties into your point like. I think it's Mr. Wilkins, who's the vampire in disguise, and he cuts her or bites her, or yeah, just Stephen Wilkins, yeah, her. yeah, like he's just, or she's just like, up, oh, oh, she just had too much to drink, or she partied too hard, and she just can't hang, so I'm gonna just <laughs> sit her nicely, prop her up against this little storefront, and off I go. <laughs> I didn't know it was him until the werewolf segment. I don't think like most at the very people, end. yeah, I don't think anyone yeah. would pick that out. Yeah, because we're the he's the first character we get introduced to in the movie with the fat kid kind of pushing over pumpkins and just eating all the candy in his house that has razor blades in it. Yeah, that kid sucks. Eating tons and tons of razor blades, and then he just starts vomiting out gallons and gallons of chocolatey blood. That kid plays a really good role in this film, I think, because he's and playing, bad Santa. Yeah, and bad, so and that's, bad Santa. He's in Bad Santa, yeah. and then also um, there's a Christmas movie, Unaccompanied Minors. He's the abominable snowman in that. Um, that's what they call him, but he's just a kid. Um, but anyways, he he has like this very niche role throughout his childhood. Um, but I think he plays a really great. You know, it's someone who who. I don't know if you look at him from a younger age perspective, he'd be that bully. He's that big kid who just beat, you know, he'll beat on you to, to just make a point because, you know, probably secretly people are calling him fat or whatever it might be. But he goes around smashing these jack-o'-lanterns for no apparent reason other than to be a punk, to be a vandal. Sure. Um, and it's funny that he runs into his principal and his principal is, you know, trying to be kind of all nice to him uh, and like, you know, get him to think that the candy's okay to eat, but really he's been secretly plotting to kill kids um, for, God, who knows how long. Um, I think the more important or the more interesting part of that story is the relationship between the principal and his son, Billy. That's creepy. Right? Yeah. Because the whole well, you time... Well, don't, you don't even... Yeah, you don't even get it when he's burying the body and throws like the, the kid's finger over the fence to, to kind of segmenting into the last segment in the whole film. Yeah, Mr. Krieg, yeah. Yeah, and his kid's like yelling and screaming, and he's like, shh, why? Because you'll bother the neighbors, because you think that he's hiding the bodies from his son, right? Right. Yeah, that's a good, like... He like, doesn't ever say that. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 you think he, he's hiding the body from his son the first time you watch this, because right. this is where I'm coming in from as a virgin totally. of this film. Totally, totally. And he... When he goes down in the basement to carve a jack lantern with his son, he's like, let's carve a scary face. It's the kid's head on a plate. They're so in on it. You're set up to think it's like a jack o' lantern, but like, nope, dad's this, this nice sociopath <laughs> dude who really loves his son. Why did also... mommy have to die? <laughs> I thought he was going to kill his kid. Right. That's the other thing that they set up because he takes that butcher knife from the kitchen and puts it kind of behind his back so the kid doesn't see it as they're going down you know, the basement steps. And you're kind of left to believe at that moment, oh, shoot, like maybe kill a kid. Wilkins is going to kill his own son possibly. I yeah. don't know. And then, bam, the big twist isn't even done yet. You know what I mean? Like the – I just want to gush there. about the writing. Yeah, like it's just very cleverly done. Um, and you can see where a lot of these are just individual stories that don't have any coercion at all. And then where they just blend it beautifully in the script. Um, but the whole thing with Billy, like, I don't know if anyone picked up on this, but he's dressed very similar, uh, similarly to Chucky from Child's Play. He has the bib overalls, the striped long sleeve shirt, mm -hmm. and the red hair. And yeah, at the end, know, he's I'm... dressed up like his dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is. Handing out candy. He is. I wonder if he knows at that point that his dad's gone for good. 
Let's put a pin on that. I doubt it. I mean, how would he know, right? I don't think so, because the werewolves are just coming back at that point. Yeah, it kind of like kind of sucks though. Like he has this nice tender moment with, with his son. Granted, it's at the at the you know at the hands of a death of a kid, but uh, yeah, but that all kind of gets washed away when uh, he gets eaten up by the werewolves later in the film. I, don't know, I guess everyone gets their just desserts in the end. Yeah, it is a very weird twist of events, though. Like one one second you think his storyline is completely done, right? Um, and then and then two seconds later, bam, he just gets brought back in and he's he's murdered. Um, you know, later on, it's crazy because huh, we'll get there. The the principal story uh, that that's basically it in the anthology. Um, so moving uh, moving back a little bit because the girls. Um, a storyline that I think is amazingly done throughout the entirety of this film is the surprise party. So it's Lori, um, her sister Danielle, and then their friends Maria and Janet. They're all being, they're all dressing up for Halloween. So we get Emma, her husband mostly finds Disney her. Mostly Disney princesses. Mostly Disney princesses. And Little Red Riding Hood. You're going to laugh, which I didn't get at first. I was like, she's a cute yeah. Little Red Riding Hood. Why is that funny? Rogues dressed up as Little Red Riding Hood. There you go. Yep. It's it's it makes sense as the movie progresses, right? It all makes sense. Yep. But when they're in the booths and they're changing, the little boy comes up. He's looking through the peephole. That's actually the actor who plays Sam. They, you know, the girls, they're all getting ready or whatever, and they have that conversation about finding a date. That's where we get the, um, you know, to she- meet us at Sheep's Meadow. You get the uh, runt of the litter comment. You know, later on, you get a couple other things, and then that kind of gets put off to the side. We hit the principals storyline and then we move on to the next storyline um which is to me like this is my least favorite storyline but uh i agree yeah me too it's a little long in my opinion and not as like impactful i don't know clark what do you think too just out of curiosity the about that. no the halloween school bus slumber party massacre 2 <laughs> i i thought this is probably one of the better ones Honestly, it's, okay. it is a little long, but they do go through the story, and I feel like this one ties everything together at the end. It does I, have I a understand. very good job of that, yeah. I would have liked some more, I don't know, some connection with her actually being a witch, but because uh, I think that's what they were going for. But they don't really do that. It's just some, some quick, like, this girl might be on the spectrum type jokes and calling her the R word. But yeah, I like the zombies. Yeah. I like the chains. I like the chase. Mm-hmm. I don't know. John, did you have something else you want to add there? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So like this story, it's not my favorite. Like I, I feel the other stories are more kinetic and more stuff happens. Um, but what I did like a lot about the story were two things. Um, well, more than two things, but the main things are were I love how Rhonda. I like. I like the exposition. She rattles off some of the lore about Sawin and everything, and uh, you know, and she kind of is like our little the mouthpiece to why there are rules and why we do certain things. And also, I like the um, I like just like the fact that uh, you know she kind of has this kind of hero hero arc in a little small way. Like the kids pick on her. She's kind of you know. You know, like like uh, Clark's thing kind of hints hints to be on the spectrum. You know, doesn't have a lot of friends. Probably isn't too popular with people. But you know what? Her 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 intellect and her intelligence and and just you know getting the upper hand. You know, was really fun for me. Like you know, these kids are jerks. And uh, like you know, I didn't really realize the point you made earlier, Clark, about um, or I'm sorry, Curtis, about uh, how you don't see any deaths on screen. Which is very true because she kind of goes up the elevator and she she leaves the the kids at the bottom. You see them hear them scream, and uh, and she kind of looks at Sam like she kind of kind of like gets it, and she kind of goes on her merry way with the pumpkin or jack o' lantern still lit in her wagon. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a long one and kind of like, but it's like a good lull between all the stuff with the uh, principal and then the werewolf introduction before it's kind of sandwiched between the werewolf story. Yeah. I honestly so, struggle with the werewolf portion a little bit more than this. I, I like this one because there's a dead like me connection to it. The uh, girl who's dressed as the angel. And remember the pussycat, the drunk pussycat lady? Do you kids want to drink yeah. <laughs> when they're looking for jack The two uh-huh. of them are main characters in Dead Like Me. So I was like, that's a cool connection to this, this show I like. Oh, I didn't pick up on that. 
Yeah. Good call. Very good cool. catch. Yeah, you've actually talked about Dead Like Me, I think, as one of your What Did I Watch recently, um, which is now on my watch list, and I think I'm almost there. But The first season's good. The second season, not so much. Okay. All right. I'll keep that in mind when I get through it, um, or get to it, I should say. Uh, the the I want to talk about the cat lady for a second, for a real quick second. Mm-hmm. So that whole party moment, like... The, the poor kids are being tortured by this lady. And I can't remember if she's like a teacher of theirs or a friend's mom or what exactly. But then you have the hot dog dude in the background who looks like he's just having sex with some other chick who's at the party. Dude, that whole party is a sex festival if you just watch what's going on in the background. It's terrible. These kids are just super uncomfortable. She offers one of the kids, the kids, one of the kids is like, yeah, I'll take a drink. And the girl's like, no. Well, because she knows yeah, they have she, bigger and plans. She, <laughs> and she opens the door very wide and kind of leaves the door open. Like I was like, come on, have some sense of yourself. Have some wherewithal to close the door a little bit, crack it or something, because these are children. And <laughs> Or open it, step yeah, out, and then close it. Like, one, or, you know, one or the other. Gosh. But also, those same kids were also the ones at uh, the principal's house, too. And the little boy the, in the pirate outfit, he noticed the, uh, the blood trail. So they kind of like we kind of walk with them for a little while through this whole through, well not through the whole movie but till their story's up at least so another good tree of this film is a lot of people we kind of see over and over again and we see they see their connection but uh, I digress yeah so uh, something that I mean I'm I want to get to so that way I can bring it up about the beginning of the movie to see if you guys caught it this time around uh, for you John and maybe if you caught it I don't know. Clark, did you do the two-watch rule before this episode, or did you only watch it once? I unfortunately only was able to watch it the one time. Okay, so we'll see if you picked up on it on your first watch. We'll see. It was at the three-minute mark in the movie that then wraps around to the end of Halloween's school bus massacre. It's crazy. Um, but, okay, so we get so we get these kids. They're trick-or-treating. They're going door-to-door. They've hit the principal's office. Uh, they hit this crazy hot dog sex party office or, or house Um, and then they decide that they want to, you know, they're gathering these jack-o'-lanterns and they need a a certain amount of them for, uh, you know, plot purposes, literally for plot purposes. Um, and they go pick up this young girl, Rhonda, who unfortunately is being, yeah, she's being bullied. She's being pulled, you know, they're They're, going to prank prank her. her. One of, one of the kids actually likes her and he tries to take her side. Schrader, yeah. yeah. Chips the pirate and then, uh girl with the uh headgear uh i don't remember her name she's a uh, sarah i guess she's the first gone yeah so yeah they get, they, drink. <laughs> <laughs> so i think i think here's my here's my beef with this storyline there's just it it's to me it is the longest in the film which is a little drawn mm-hmm. out for me i think personally Um, And it's not that the segments are bad. None of these segments in this film are are bad. They're all really good. Um, But if I was going to go make popcorn or go run and grab a drink, it'd probably be during this segment, personally. Because I think once I've seen it, there isn't anything too tricky to it. It's pretty straightforward. Kids are taking this young girl. They're going to go play a prank on her. They tell this really... Uh, you know, crazy story about how these eight mentally challenged children died on a school bus because the driver was paid by the parents to get rid of them. Um, it goes wrong. The whole bus goes into the quarry, but somehow the bus driver was never seen from again, right? We see in the movie that the bus driver makes it to the shore. He's breathing very heavy, but no one ever sees the bus driver again. And I think that's amazing, and I love the setup. For the rest, of we the we know who the bus driver is at yes. the very end. Yes, so and I think that we know who he is at the very be- yeah. Like this, that helps me stay on. Right, that's why I don't think the segment's bad. It has a purpose. There's a whole meaning for it. It's it's really good. Where this I start to connects, lose it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, this is the story that connects everything together. So this is the one yeah. that gives you that that backdrop. So we've said that. Go ahead, Curtis. So I think what where I get lost in this one is the zombies. Is the you know, the, the mentally challenged children getting up out of the, the water and going after the kids. I wish, and I, I swear to God, if they had done this, I would be way happier with this segment. If Rhonda had been an actual witch and they would have done more with that, like you were saying before, mm-hmm. I would have said, best segment in the film, 
absolutely hands down no argument i won't i won't let it happen <laughs> but um i think that would have made it better i think the fact that she hat nods or you know tips her hat basically to sam as she's leaving um i think at that moment like i have more respect for it, her like i love Rhonda's character i would have loved to have seen her be maybe more um more witchy i guess in a in a way i think to that point real quick if i may is that um you know okay it's not ever blatantly said that she is a witch but it's also not ever blatantly said that she's a um she's on the spectrum we, all we can do is infer and i think you know in some i'm trying to i'm gonna go around the moon to scratch my elbow on this one so i apologize but uh um i feel in a weird way like it maybe doherty was trying to like put the character of Rhonda as like she's on maybe the spectrum or she's she has she's on a different wavelength of some kind and that is what's allowing her to kind of like acknowledge Sam and vice versa like she gets it she's maybe she's more attuned to things than, than your average Joe and Sam's like okay you're, you're not one of us but you're like you, you get it and you're good people and you know and you're playing by the rules which is the most important part but you you also understand and you respect the rules. So I think, I would, yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm kind of foaming at the mouth for more development for Rhonda's character because I think there's so much more that could have been done there to, to echo your actual point. Definitely. Um, and I think the witchiness, I, I think the witchiness would have been just a better, like I said, it just would have made that segment just more, even more fun for me if she had... You know, when she got to the top of the cage or the, you know, the, the, the elevator lifted to the top, when she looks up, maybe her eyes glimmered a little bit. Like that would have just added an extra like I'm I'm in tune to the spirits kind of a situation. You know, little things like that can elevate a performance. Um, I just feel like they didn't smile. Yeah. A even a creepy smile. little smile would have been cool. Yeah. 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 I don't know. There, there's some things you can do with the tone of it. To, I don't know. I, I keep saying I don't know over and over again. I feel that Rhonda was relatable up until the point she decided to leave them for dead. And had she shown like a creepy smile or had Sam, the boy, or traitor, had been less uh, of a empathetic or sympathetic character, would have gone a little bit better. I mean, because that girl was absolutely terrible. Uh, Macy... And Chip was just kind of a little putz. And Sarah was just kind of there. She didn't really do anything. No. Just died. Yeah. Just, just more fo- cannon fodder. I, I will say, I don't think it's an accident that they dressed Rhonda as a witch. I think that was definitely purposeful. Sure. I, yeah. Sure. Made the costume sure. herself. See all the pumpkins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just something special about that girl. So that's some uh, just a, a random because I like to throw fun facts throughout if I can so we don't have to bottle up the the end of the the episode. So all right. the pumpkins used in the film were uh, they were foam, and they like mm-hmm. to like brag and say no pumpkins were harmed in the making of this film, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, God, this is such a, such a good movie. Yeah, no, there were a ton of pumpkins. Yeah. I feel like there's no way they could have actually used real pumpkins. Well, they could have used them, of course, but. You know, or set up and reshoots and shooting, and like pumpkins would have, the shelf life would have <laughs> deteriorated quicker than I, th- I feel some productions. You would have had allowed to t- have or... a team of just pumpkin carvers on deck, you know? Right, and they all have to be the same size or the same shape, and all these things. And foam so, is just easier think... for sure. Yeah, yeah, foam doesn't quit on you, man. Quote, foam's there for life, and the kids can actually so... carry those pumpkins by themselves and not need adults around either. Very true. Good point. So let's go ahead and move on to the surprise party because I think personally, um, I'm not going to say it's my favorite, but it might be my favorite. We'll get to favorites in a little bit here, but the surprise party. So this is the werewolf scene. This is, I mean, this is some brutal eating bodies and you don't see any of it. But how do you guys feel about that? Like, did you want to see more? Did you not want to see more? Like, this is, it was freaking insane. So, so. Go ahead, ahead, uh, John. I'll talk after. Okay, so um, the first thing at the time I saw this movie, um, the werewolves reminded me of dog soldiers, werewolves. Like, y'all saw saw that that too? 
Yep. So, so, and I really love that movie. So I, I didn't know if that was like just a, a coincidence or like a, like a thread to dog soldiers. Um, I really liked how the skin, they, they peeled off their skin. Like they're taking off a pair of jeans, man. There's just like, Oh, I'm done with this outfit for the day. I'm going to get in my, uh, <laughs> in my birthday suit, so to speak. Um, I mean, but the werewolves look great. Um, I did notice, like, uh, me and my tangents, I'm sorry. Uh, I did notice a quick uh, a continuity break when uh, Anna Paquin's character was finally, finally, you know, transforming uh, some of the makeup. Some of the CGI was more evolved, and she looked back down at the victim, and it was back to more of her face again. But that's, eh, it happens. It's a movie. What do you want? So a and, quick uh, note about that. I'm curious, uh, because, uh -huh. so... If this is her first time, right? They keep mentioning that her first time, her first time, virgin, blah 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 blah. Like, right. has she not fully transformed ever before? Is that why she does keep that very human-like look still? You know, I that think that like might really... be the case. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure. It's all, it's yeah, it's, it's very up in the air. It could go so many different ways. Um, I don't think we. I think we all kind of figured out they don't mean virginity at this point. You know, maybe they mean virginity of a different nature. And first it could kill. Be, um, Popping yeah, a cherry of her first I, kill. I, I think yeah. it's more first kill. I think she she had would have had to have transformed at least a few times before to kind of be used to it. I I, I guess I don't know because she not never sheds her skin really. Type right? of werewolves. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, she doesn't tear her skin off. She doesn't show like the fur or anything. Oh. But my favorite that's part true. about this segment is the return of the principal and the connection that we get to go yeah. back to the beginning. Because I don't know, there's this killer, he's going around, he's dressed as a vampire. And at first I thought this was a vampire segment where like a vampire is going to show up and uh, murder this girl. And he kills a girl, he's making out with her, kisses her neck, and then she sees blood and he puts her dead body in the middle of a populated street and just people think she's drunk. The, main, the couple from the very beginning are like, oh, she's drunk, just forget her. Yeah. She's asking for help. She doesn't need call, it. Call out to our first two characters of the movie right, right there. Right. Everything's interconnected. Uh, the werewolf howls get heard by the kids at the Halloween school bus massacre. They're, they're all trying to have this super sexy party, and I'm thinking that, okay, these are, these are kind of slutty girls. I have no, no idea for my first time watching that these girls are werewolves. There's no implication aside from like small hints here and there. She's dressed as little red riding hood talk about being the runts of the litter and when i heard that i was like huh is this werewolves this is werewolves but i didn't get that until near the end where the body gets thrown over and it's in a red riding hood jumpsuit or hood pull it up and it's the principal from the beginning who is revealed to be this guy take off his fangs and then anna paquin's like mm, dinner and the coolest part about this one is Sam just kind of like plopping his legs up and down and hanging out with them. And I'm like, I love this kid. That's when I that's when I developed the relationship with Sam. This point, <laughs> everything else like with this scene, I I, I like the, kind of the twist at the end, but I can kind of do with or without it. it. It's Sam who and the principal who tie it for me. Loved it. Yeah, I would say that uh, you know, Sam's appearance there it was fitting because it's fitting in that he's in every other segment in some capacity. Um, but you kind of don't know why he's there here now. Like he has like a little role to play. On, well, I guess he doesn't really have a role. Yeah, he does. He doesn't have a role to play really primarily in the world of story. He's more like an observer. Like he's like, Oh, more nefarious evil things are happening. Hey, that's in my wheelhouse. I'll just go put my feet up by the fire and just kind of watch things kind of happen. And you know, that's fun for me. And, um, I don't know. I, I, I like I like the werewolf. I like like werewolves. I'm like I'm a, I'm kind of biased, I guess. But uh, yeah, I kind of like how it was also the principle that uh, you know, <laughs> like sucks to be you, dude. Like you can only be a sociopath for so long before you know it catches up to you. And um, it got he got his just desserts. I feel and uh, because you know you think about it because he killed the boy and he killed he killed that girl in the street. Like we don't know how long he's been doing this and. The fact that it finally caught up to him, it, it almost seemed like, like justice in a way. Cause I feel like the werewolves are just—it's natural for them. They're just doing what they do. I had like—I got no problem with that. Like it is what it is. But this guy, like, hey, you seem like you should die, and he dies. So, great. 
Yeah, so looking Good. at Sam's Halloween rules, I think because he's there for a reason usually every time mm -hmm. that we see him, right? And I think the reason yeah. in this one is that he's there to make sure that these werewolves on Halloween, this is, you know, these are the Halloween rules. This isn't like everyday rule uh, rules, but it's it's the last rule. It's the never hurt the innocent. So that principle is not innocent. And I think Sam's kind of there to help make sure that the werewolves don't attack anyone who may be innocent. But then again, at the same time, what about the hot dog guy? Was he not innocent? Like, then we start to unpack it maybe too far and, and go a little too deep in it. But... Um, yeah, I don't think we should over overthink this fun movie no. that's just four segment. No, and I and I love seeing Sam in different. I love yeah. seeing Sam in different kind of. Uh, I don't know the way he acts in each segment is is fun. It, it's you know, in one he's just kind of walking towards the elevator, and one he's sitting there dangling his feet on the the uh, you know the wooden yeah. log or whatever. So, uh, two pipe, two yeah. things I absolutely oh, yeah. loved about this segment. Uh, the first one is uh, Lori is named after Lori Strode from the Halloween film. So Michael Doherty has a huge crush on like John Carpenter, um, some of your older, you know, your older horror flicks that John Carpenter's done. The Thing, um, Halloween. Mr. Krieg was based off of uh, several, two different yeah, characters from The Thing and something else as well. Yeah. So, so uh, it's just really cool to see him give like those shout outs and those different callbacks and homages uh, to films that he grew up with in the horror genre that he loves. And the other is that how awesome is that Sweet Dreams Are Made Of These cover? Like I, when that song starts, I'm like, this is, okay, best scene in the movie to me right now. Like I absolutely love that cover. Yeah, that was Is that the cover. Marilyn Manson version? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did a, he did, he did a pretty good job on that one. I think that that cover came out in uh, ninety nine when when House on Haunted Hill came out, and um, that's when it really came out. And then kind of kind of went away for a while. Then yeah, it it, it flows, it fits so so snugly, <laughs> if if I may, in this in this scene in this movie. But that's like the only big song we hear, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I can't. Right? I I wouldn't be able to pick out anything else from the album or throughout the film that I saw. That that's just to me. That is the theme song of Trick or Treat from 2007 is Sweet Dreams Are Made of These by Marilyn Manson. Like that, oh, it just sets the tone so beautifully. Oh, so yeah. we finally get the, the, a lot of cleanup, in my opinion, on different storylines put together here. So after the surprise party with the werewolves, um, you get, so, so you get kind of put back in time. Cause while Wilkins is burying Charlie's body, the fat kid from, uh the front of the house that he you know that he killed and put the head in the, the basement to do the jack-o-lantern with his son that's when Krieg comes out and his dog is barking and there's that whole scene so now so we've right. we, we've rewound time a little bit i guess is the easiest way to say it um and everything happens at the same time in this this movie yeah like, and it's, it's done so well <laughs> And Sackboy or Sam has basically walked from Mr. Krieg's house, from from the principal's house to Mr. Krieg's house, to the couple's house, through the the haunted or the the, the lake, to the werewolves, and back. All in the short time. Like he's been everywhere in such a short amount of time. I wanna say the werewolves is actually in the time in the linear timeline, that's the last thing that happens, I wanna say. When they're coming back, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Creek coming and opening the door, though. And the couple doesn't die until... Well, Mr. Creek sees Sackboy or Sam going towards their house. So it's kind of hard to really get like a, a rational flow or logical flow of where he actually is at what point. Mm -hmm. I think he just has the ability to be everywhere at once as the spirit of Halloween. Sure, but yeah. I, I mean, to a point, like there is a little bit of... Like when Mr. Krieg opens that door at the very end of the movie, um, Sam is watching the the our first two characters, Emma is it Emma and Henry come home. Right. So and that happens, they come home and the werewolves are being dropped off. So mm -hmm. we know that They're... the werewolf party already happened. So yep. Sam is definitely back. I I would almost say that the end of the final part of the movie is actually the beginning of the movie. 
I would, I think you're right. And I kind of, but my, my, my question is like, where, how, where did Sam start? Where did he end? And I need to rewatch the movie really to, yeah. to kind of get a logical flow. Yeah, but I my understanding <laughs> is he's been in so many locations in such a short amount of time that they have to be really close to one another. Like the werewolf party party has to be right next to the lake. The, uh, the houses have to be right next to the werewolf party. Yeah. Otherwise, he has this ability small to town, be where he wants to be. Small town in Ohio. That answers. That's the yeah. only way to answer that question, right? So, um, Mr. Krieg, I, I, this is a lot of fun watching Sam actually getting to see Sam outside of the sack mask, getting to watch Sam fight Mr. Krieg. Um, you get a little bit of a hostile moment in this movie, which really like for some reason. Anytime you see a cutting of an Achilles tendon, it always makes me like shiver. It gives me like goose goose flesh. I don't know why, but it just creeps me out. I don't like it. And they do it really well in hospital. Same way with like, <laughs> yeah, with eyes and teeth. I just can't do it, man. Like, but yeah, Achilles tendon, like, like uh, that's a hard pass for me as well. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Did you see the new Halloween 2018? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the teeth scene in that the was bathroom, fun. how was that? <laughs> Did you like that? Was it? No, no, no! I did not like that at all. I liked his <laughs> pumpkin skull face. Yeah, I liked his mouth and just Getting he looked back to really Sam. good. He, he when did. his hand gets cut off, it's like moving around, checking to see if he's all right. And the kid's just like overpowering Mister Craig the entire time. He gets shot, but he's just toying with him just for a little bit of chocolate. Real realistically, that's <laughs> all that he's doing it for. He's just doing Dems the it. rules. Yeah, them's the yeah. rules. Yeah. But see, this is why I think, uh, Clark, you said this is your favorite segment, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, mine, mine too. And I think the reason why, one, is, like, Brian Cox is just so, he's so damn fun to watch. <laughs> I just love this guy. And so he's like, obviously, the most, he's like this cratchety old man. He's just pissed off at everything. Life sucks. And, and then you had that with the character of Sam. And reason why Sam's so great in this segment is because this is the first, and of course it's at the end, how it should be, the evolution of what we see Sam, what he can and can't do. And this is the first full-blown, like, palette. We see everything, like, Sam, he can regenerate, he can heal, he's, he's a pumpkin with seeds and guts for his insides, his innards, he can walk on walls, he can do all these cool, kind of cool, like, he, there's a lot of stuff that he can do that he just kind of, like, almost in a way kind of shoots his load fighting Mr. Krieg. And for me, that's just really fun. Like I love going back to that scene and like Mr. Krieg just cannot win. Like he's doing everything he can. He just gets his ass kicked hand over fist. It's so damn fun to watch. What is, was written on the wall trick or treat. Give me something good to eat. If you don't. Yeah. That childhood rhyme. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And oh. the whole time it's just him fighting. I love the entire struggle between him and the kid. And then he slams the window, just trying to get help from uh, who is whoever the principal. principal's name is. Yeah, Principal yeah, Wilkins. Yeah, yeah. And like he just looks at him, he's like, whatever, and goes inside the house. And we we see this at the very beginning of the movie too. So great callback there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a phenomenal. Like like threads getting getting tied together nicely. For... I think the most important thread here is that you know when all it's done, the battle's done. Uh, Sam takes the, the, because Krieg offered him candy, which thus fulfills the tradition of Halloween, Sam leaves him alone and Krieg is totally confused, right? When he gets up though, he goes over to the fireplace and continues to do what he was doing before he was interrupted. And that was burning the photographs of the kids that he killed because mm. he's the effing bus driver. Boom! Great, mind blown. great tie-in. Great <laughs> tie-in ties into the principal story, ties into the uh, to the other one, and then we get a tie-in to the werewolves right after as he goes out to hand out candy. They're driving back. Yep. And in the car. he's yeah, they're driving a car, wiping their blood-stained mouths, having a good time. And we see Sam kind of walking towards uh, Emma and uh, her boyfriend's Henry. home. Yep. Yeah, Henry. Wow. And then you get the resurrected children coming, you know, they come up to the door, they knock on the door asking for candy and uh treat, uh, treat. I mean at this the point mentally disturbed children. Yeah. Yeah. I like how they See, just keep is... adding different characteristics to those poor uh zombie kids. This is the one part of the movie I didn't really care for, if I'm being honest, guys. 
it's it's I feel I feel like you know like it sucked what Mr. Creek did. I, I got a lot of and I feel like everyone in this film that deserves or come up and kind of gets it. You know, either they don't follow the rules or they were just a bad person at some point. But like I feel, I feel like the ending like it's it's good I, and I get why it's there to bring the kids back because it's Halloween, they're zombies now and they want to go after Mr. Creek. I don't know. I feel like if they left it at Mr. Creed kind of being like how they, he kind of got scrooged a little bit by Sam and they kind of left him as like a changed man would have been really like, I would have been fine if they kind of stopped it there. Just giving yeah, out like one. mints though. He, it's all he's, he's giving got, out Clark. mints. It's all he's got. That's why yeah. it's, but he's playing ball now. So, yeah. so <laughs> but it's, it's following one rule, but I think the problem here and John, I, I don't disagree with you, right? It's always nice to get either. that. Uh, a somewhat positive ending sometimes and showing that people can change and people can grow and evolve and become better human beings. Um, but I think Sam's rules just apply too heavily there, which has never hurt the innocent. I mean, I feel like the kids, got their, the kids got their Point. vengeance, you know, and they're mm-hmm. like, they did it, uh, which is kind of exciting. So the no, only... it could have been both ways, right? Totally. Not to, and, well, not to beat a dead horse, I mean, yeah, he is the bus driver that killed them, but why aren't they going after their parents? Like, did they get off scot free? Maybe like, they do, or maybe, maybe the kids maybe don't do. know. Maybe the kids don't mm-hmm. know that yeah. their parents paid him to do it. You know, that's, tr- that's true. Um, or maybe they're just hungry for some Krieg meat. <laughs> Krieg meat—it's the best kind of meat on the market right now. It's going for like four ninety-nine a pound. Um, I mean, when you rise in the grave, what else do you want? <laughs> Honestly. So let's be real. So this is that moment where I was like, okay, I want to see if if either of you picked up on it. Um, when the kids, the the zombie kids, are leaving Krieg's house um, at the very beginning of the movie, it's the three minute and nineteen second mark. You can see them walking away after they had left Krieg's house, and Emma and Henry are just getting home, and she's taking off her robot box costume. So you can see the zombies leaving. As they're coming up to to their house to um, you know start taking down the decorations, and that's that's where the movie begins. Um, I don't know if either of you caught that. Nope, absolutely Good amazing. I'll check out. We'll take a I look caught, next time. Yeah, I caught everything else. I caught the girls in the car, the girl Rondo with the wagon, the the um, and everything else during the parade because we they keep running into each other. All these characters. But that opening scene, no, I uh, totally blew past me. So the next time you watch it, just remember. Right off the bat, they're going to be on the left side of the screen. So Emma and, and Henry are over here talking, doing their thing, and Sam is watching them. But if you look, his perif, the left side of the screen, it's all the zombie kids leaving the screen. It's amazing. It's great. I had never caught it until this time. Um, I can't even say that I'm the one who saw it, right? I had a hint. There was someone who gave me a hint. Um, but it's amazing. It's really cool when you see it. I mean, like you said, the the – the festival or the parade, whatever was going on, you see Emma and Henry there. So you know that they were out having a good time at some point. And that's also when the principal was out lurking, doing his blood feeding. So when did he do the initial trick or treat kill? You know, like trying to put all that timeline together is a project in its own, but it's very tight. It's a very tight timeline for sure. Yeah. It's gotta be a very I small like... town, Clark. That's, that's all <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 I was reading the a description. It said it all happens on the same block, which uh, some of it does, I guess, to a degree. Maybe the park is down the block, like at the end of the block, maybe. That's where the forest is in the lake. It's right by the block. Interesting. Nah. Interesting. Uh, I think they, they visit the same block, but it doesn't take in, It's definitely not entirely there, but it's close enough to where kids can walk to, you know that place where the zombie babies are cool very nice zombie babies does anyone have anything else they kind of want to like end with or or any last comments about the film that that we didn't get to yet before i break down the rules so um i don't think this is already discussed but um so saw wayne the the celtic not holiday celtic festival or whatever that was like the inspiration for what, what we now know as Halloween is Sam Haim to our English speaking people like you and I. So that's where Sam got his name from was the name of the, of the uh, festival, so to speak, the pagan festival. So that's pretty fun. 
Thank you for pointing that out. It was definitely on the list yeah. of things I read, but I didn't, yeah, completely forgot to actually call that out. And Rhonda does a really great job, I think, of giving you the most brief explanation of Sawain, right? So, I mean, I oh, can't yeah. do it any better than she did. <laughs> cool. So, the actual, so right now, funny enough, I'm watching Supernatural for the first time ever, and they just had an episode, season three, I want to say, about Halloween, and they kind of went over some of the same lore like we, you know, we wear masks to hide, we give candy to appease, and all these fun things. So that was a good, also a little extra juice for that little, little nugget of information. So definitely hold on right to now. that too, because I know when we get to the what did you watch, um, I know what you've been watching because I follow you on Twitter. Um, but we'll get there. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. So real quick, Sam's Halloween rules. These are fun. I think these are great. Um, I actually break some of these rules, so if I'm not around after Halloween, you know why. Uh, rule number one, always hand out candy to trick-or-treaters. Um, you know, that's a pretty obvious one. Most most people do that nowadays. Rule number two, always wear a costume. Um, in some ways, people wear costumes all the time. Rule number three, never blow out a jack-o'-lantern before midnight. Never! Rule number four. Never, never, ever. <laughs> always respect the dead. Rule number five. Always check your candy. I just think that's a helpful tip. You know, everyone should know that. Check your candy. Rule number six. Never take down your decorations before November 1st. Clark, that means you too, bud. You have to wait. Oh, man. And the final rule. Do you mean the greatest holiday of all time? Halloween. I think not. Halloween runs all year round. And the Hell final yeah. rule, never hurt the innocent. I think that's a good one also. It's just a fun tip. Yeah, those are good rules. I could get behind those. But who is the innocent and who is not? That's that's something Sam will have to tell us one day. Well, that's all for the major part of the episode. Now we're going to head in kind of, I, I don't know, the, the final segments can be a little different. We're not going to really do a fun fact and trivia. We threw a lot out at, at you all throughout the episode, so I think that suffices. Um, where we'll go next is the what have you been up to lately slash plug. So we'll start with John. Go ahead and let John plug his awesome podcast and then tell us what you've been watching lately. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. So uh, my podcast is Blood, Sweat, and Popcorn. Started back in January of 2020 and uh, got 30 episodes out now. And if you uh, are listener listening out there um, want to hear uh, – Curtis and I did an episode on the movie Clue that came out about a month ago. Uh, that was a very, very fun episode because Clue is an amazing movie and freaking Curtis was awesome as a guest. So a uh, quick plug for that episode. But um, what I have coming up in the, in the pipeline, in the shoot for my show, um, I'm doing a lot of Halloween stuff because, you know, we're in the spirit and, uh, and such. So I just recently did a episode of, on Train to Busan and also did a rapid review of Peninsula, its sequel. So I'm going to continue my thread of zombie-related uh, material. I have uh, a zombie film I'm doing uh, shortly. Uh, it's already done. It's going to be out probably this week. And then two weeks from now, I have a, a mini-sode with my guest Andrew, and we talk about uh, just zombies, period. Like zombies as a subgenre, as, uh, as creatures, however you want to slice and dice it, that's how we how we approached it. So as far as what I've been watching, I uh <laughs> I for the I don't know what, what prompted me to do this. I started Supernatural for the third time and I finally got past the first five episodes. This is my the first two times I just couldn't stick with it. Uh and now I'm on episode I'm sorry, now I'm on season five and I'm loving every minute of it. I'm like so into it. It's it's so great. It's so fun. I want that damn Impala so bad now. <laughs> Curtis is so out. glad to hear that. I'm over here fist pumping. <laughs> like, I'm so happy because I was one yeah, of the people on Twitter, so like, really pushing positive, you know, uh, connotations towards you about Supernatural. And just, I mean, I absolutely love the show. And I was turned on to it from a mutual friend of Clark and I, actually, Laurel, um, who we both work yes. with. And she loves it. She loves it. Um, her and I have very similar opinions as, as we get to the later seasons. And I warned you. I think the best seasons are up front. I think you're already actually through most of the best seasons, and you're going to be kind of disappointed as you get later on, but it's a really long show, so you have a lot of content to get through. Welcome to yeah. Fangirlville after season six. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's what it is. Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, as far as other stuff besides Supernatural, it just um, you know, I go on Vudu or Netflix or Hulu or something. I just kind of like catch up on on new things I haven't seen yet. Like I'm watching also on HBO uh, Lovecraft Country, which I'm really enjoying as well. Um, I may do an episode on that, and I'm anticipating what's coming out this weekend. Well, at the time of recording, is the uh, Haunting of Bly Manor the sequel to the uh, Netflix series Haunting of Hill House. So, yeah, that's all I got on my plate right now. Nothing too big. So Very cool. Well, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate your time. Um, I know with time zones and whatnot, it's a lot later for you than it is for us. So um, I do appreciate you being here. Um, We're going to go ahead and let Clark go with what he's been up to lately. Whoa, Whoa, man, no. I want to hear more from John. John. I want to hear all about John's life. I want him to tell us his life story. Uh, <laughs> I'm here in San. I'm in the Bay Area right now. I'm not technically in San Francisco, but uh, we're going to Yosemite here in a little bit. We're going to do some backpacking. But in terms of like movies that and shows that I think people should check out, I think The Boys is probably the best thing I've seen this year with season two. And I'm this is coming from someone who read the comic books. It's completely vastly different from the comics. If you've not read them, highly recommend it. Comics are a little bit different. All the characters, uh, the main characters all have superpowers. Huey, Butcher, that happens in the first issue. So much darker in terms of the comedy. Funnier, too. Read it if you haven't. Watch the show if you haven't. 10 out of 10. Highly recommend. Awesome. Good to hear. How about you, Curtis? I want to hear about your life, too. You know, like, what's going on in your, your world? Uh, you know, two two major things I've dived into lately. I went back into Escape from Tarkov. That's my gaming habit right now, which is it's a really uh, it's a really good military sim type game. There's a lot of inventory management and whatnot. And I know John's a uh, military guy, so um, I don't know how much you game. John, do you game a lot or no? Uh, I, yes and no. When I'm not doing college homework. And I'm not working, working. Then absolutely, I'll I'll game. Plates full. Got it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so so EFT has been my kind of I don't know my late night I can't sleep just play kind of stuff. And then um, it's taken over a bit of a good habit or obsessiveness. So I, it's something I can just sit on and 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 noodle with. There's a ton to it, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I see you playing it all the time. Like yeah. When, when I'm on Steam, you're playing it. Pretty much. Um, I've been I've been grounded from playing anything scary by my daughter, so that's why I'm not playing any Dead by Daylight lately. But uh, once she gets over that hump of being scared, uh, I'll get back to it. Um, plus, I'll be back in the 20 ranks, so everyone will be easy to kill. Uh, so you're as, already there, man. <laughs> as for what I've been watching, uh, it, I went back to Riverdale. I know it sounds kind of weird. Um, it's not something normally I'd probably watch. But I really liked season one and two. We got into three and it got weird because of some gargoyles and something rather. I don't remember what it's called. Ghouls and gargoyles or something. I don't know. But now I've gone back and watched it. It's actually really spooky. They've added a spooky flair to it, which is kind of nice. And the story's finally progressing and out of a weird dip. So I'll probably end up finishing season three. I might start four. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, Riverdale, it, you know, it's, it's kind of okay. Is it similar to The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina? No, and that's where I thought they were going with it. I thought like mm. I thought Archie and the gang were going to have a nice crossover with Sabrina on Netflix um, when it started to get that spooky flair. But when it didn't have that crossover, that's when I bailed. I was like, not worth it. Because um, I liked Sabrina season one at least. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, but there was no crossover. And then Sabrina got canceled, so it's like, whatever. Doesn't even That doesn't even matter anymore. But... Anyways, that's that's what I've been kind of doing lately, past week, I'd say. Um, yeah, cool. Well, we're going to go ahead and plug our social media, and I'm going to throw John's out there as well uh, while I'm uh, you know, talking about it. So first and foremost, please, 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 if you're not, follow our guest John, who is from the Blood, Sweat, and Popcorn show, BSP Film Podcast on Twitter. Um, once again, that is at BSP Film Podcast, Blood, Sweat, and Popcorn. Great show. Uh, one of the best episodes you can listen to is, is on Clue. Uh, I don't know why that one's so great. No biasy there at all. Um, now, you can follow us, Two Guys and Some Horror, at 
the number two guys horror pod that is the number two guys horror pod on twitter and instagram and if you want to email any suggestions or even email us uh, to possibly come on the show and be a guest like John here was, you can email us at two guys and some horror at gmail.com. That's fully written out two guys and some horror at gmail.com. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, we love you. We thank you for all the listens. We're almost at 1100 now, which is insane because at the beginning of the month, we just hit 1000 listens and man, I don't know where to go. Like we've, we've got some big plans for, for Halloween coming up. So stay tuned for that. And, uh, Yeah, I'll just say goodbye for now. See you next week. We love you. Less than three. Thanks again, guys. Take care.